Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar today. We're so glad to have you join us. As you get settled in to Zoom, hopefully you've got your cup of coffee, your notepad, your pen, because we are going to be talking about moving special education forward together. I am Jeremy Glauser, the founder and CEO of Iluma, and I am so glad to be joined by Phyllis Wolfram, who is the executive director for CASE. Today, we're going to be learning a lot of wonderful updates. We're going to be talking about some incredibly important topics. So hopefully you can walk away fully enriched and ready to take action. <laughs> Phyllis, go ahead and take us to the next slide. Okay. I want to tell you, I want to tell you just a little bit. Oh, let's go one more. I want to tell you just a little bit about what to expect today. After a short introduction, we will have um, time with Phyllis who will be talking about how we can move forward together in special education. We'll also spend time doing a Q&A and we'll have a live discussion and we will take your questions throughout the webinar. We definitely encourage you to use the chat to enter questions. We will get to those. Please do that. We also want you to know that you can turn on closed captioning Closed captioning, there's a, there's a button at the bottom of Zoom and it will say CC. George also put a comment in the chat for those of you who need closed captioning. Let me tell you a little bit about Iluma. Iluma is very much mission focused on helping kids achieve their potential. And that's why we partner with Phyllis and Case and so many amazing people who are also focused on the same mission. And then delivering good content, good resources so that you can learn, you can grow, you can feel inspired, validated, or just get some day-to-day -day tactical ideas and tools that you need in your life, in your job. We've been around for over a decade. We contract with uh, over 400 clinicians who deliver live online therapy with school systems. We've, we are very excited as a team to have just passed 33,000 students. And please follow us, engage with us. We want to engage with you, learn from you, and help move this forward. You can see our Twitter handle as well as our Facebook page there. All right, enough about Iluma. Well, maybe just a little bit more. <laughs> we do want to let you know about a, 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 an exciting offer, a fun opportunity. We are always looking to engage with you, our colleagues, our, our partners in education. And uh, there's an opportunity to get a $100 Amazon gift card simply for having a consultation with our team. So please go to eluma.com slash consultation. Or if you just go to eluma.com, you'll see a nice button at the top right. And uh, we, we really would love to engage with you. The promo code there is Eluma Webinars. Don't forget that piece. And I think George, who is uh, keeping our chat up to date, if you could also put that in there uh, for the whole group, that would be great, George. So a little bit about this webinar series. This is the beginning of our special education webinar series. And we're excited to invite lots of other guests who will talk on very pertinent, relevant topics Please register and come and join us. Even if you can't join live, you'll have an opportunity to view them afterward. We'll send out the recording. We'll send out the resources. Registering gets you signed up and on the, the distribution. So please come join us. We're excited to be able to put this on for you. Now, I want to introduce Phyllis. Phyllis is a, a good friend, a mentor, an incredible leader. And there's so much about Phyllis that I love. And uh, I hope that you come to, to uh, love what she has to share with you as well, because it, it will enrich your life. I know that she's dedicated to doing that for special education in general. Today, Phyllis is the executive director for CASE. That is the Council of Administrators uh, of Special Education and has served as president in the past, has worked in public education for 39 years, 29 of which were in administrative roles, 
and has served in rural to the largest district in Missouri. And we were just talking before the webinar, her team was as large as 400 at one point and has seen a lot, has worked on with gifted education, 504, ELL, early childhood, and has, has really volunteered and participated in a lot of ways. Case policy and legislative, legislation committee, the ad hoc committee on IDEA reauthorization, the, the, a member of the case task force, design for the future, and a member of the board of directors for the Council for Exceptional Children, CEC. Phyllis has done a lot of great work. I remember when we were experiencing the signs of COVID-19 and how that might affect, Phyllis was a go-to for our national leaders for information and for leadership in this particular area. I think uh, what we have today is a lot to learn. So buckle up, add questions to the chat, and let's, uh, let's learn from Phyllis today. Phyllis, please take us away. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, you're too kind in your introduction, and uh, but uh, the feelings mutual. It's all deserving. Love, well, thank you. I I love working uh, with you with all your staff at Iluma. Um, the best part about working with Iluma is the fact they have a heart for what they do. Um, uh, Jeremy is in this for the good, for the good of all of us and all of our students. And I, I can't say enough uh, about the work that you do and the passion that you have for what you do. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. And uh, in today's presentation, we're going to address some of the current uh, state of affairs, things that are going on in, in special education that you need to be aware of, um, some of the federal law and how it impacts special education, uh, how we partner with CEC in case we are a division of the Council uh, of Exceptional Children. I always say we are their largest division, therefore I think we're the best. Uh, our administrators, of course, address every area of special education. And as a school administrator, uh, and I still to this day, I'm a member of several divisions of the Council for Exceptional Children. I stay connected with the Division of Transition, Division of Learning Disabilities, uh, because I've been doing this a while, I get into the Pioneers Division as well, uh, the Division of Early Childhood, because I want to stay up to date. I want to stay connected. So I would really encourage you to look at the different divisions that you have an opportunity to join, not only as an administrator, uh, but as a teacher, uh, related service provider, instructional support. Um, they even now engage parents in the uh, Council for Exceptional Children so that parents can access the resources uh, that are available. Uh, to special educators, and then how you can get involved in advocacy and impacting change in special education. So stay with me as we go through all of this. I'm going to give you hopefully some really good information. I am going to talk a little bit today about our legislative summit, our three priorities that we went to Capitol Hill and, and said, here's what we need as special educators across the nation. And we'll get to that. But our summit was held on July 10th through the 13th. We're there every year in July and would uh, ask you, you can go online, you can look at future dates, mark it on your calendar and come and join us next July to share your stories with your legislators on Capitol Hill. But I do have to tell you just a little bit about CASE as we get started. Uh, and our mission uh, is to provide leadership to advance the field of special education through professional learning, policy, and advocacy. And hopefully every day we're looking at that mission statement here in the CASE office and we're saying, are we doing our job for you? Um, and, and you can let us know if we're not because we want you to hold us accountable. Our core values, visionary leadership, inclusive practices, engagement, and integrity. What we really want to do is continue to look to the future. What is coming down uh, from Washington, D.C.? What is happening in our schools across the nation that we need to be prepared for and look ahead? Be inclus inclusive in all of our practices to really engage our members and to do it with great integrity. So those are things, core values that are really important to us. I want you to meet our staff because you'll see these people present. You'll see that we do 60 minutes with Myrna every month to get an update on what's happening in Washington, D.C. Myrna Manlowitz is our case policy consultant. If you engage with case at all, you'll meet Debbie Magnifico, our case administrative assistant. That's really her last name. 
I say to Debbie all the time, I need your last name so that I could be Phil Magnifico. Wouldn't that be a cool name? But Debbie is awesome. New case staff. Case has become visible over the last two years. We have been able to, through some of our webinars and our conferences, generate some additional revenue as a professional association. And we have two new uh, staff members in the case office to help us further the work that we're doing uh, for our members and other leaders across the nation. Dr. Bridget Bright is our Director of Communication and Membership. Dr. Vicki McNamara is our Director of Professional Services. They started July 1, so you're going to see some more great things coming out of the Council of Administrators of Special Education. So uh, before I'm, go I'm going to skip to one more slide here and just give this little lesson in how things work in Congress and how we're working um, with the offices that implement the laws that Congress passes. Right now, we're uh, working with our 117th Congress. They were seated, seated January of 2021. And in January of 23, and I think it's January the 3rd, the new Congress will be seated, the 118th Congress. And this fall in the November midterm elections, you'll have an opportunity to vote so that your voice is heard for the person that you want in office. And I would really encourage you to take a look at who's on the ballot. What do they stand for? What are they doing in education? Ask those questions of them. You're a constituent, you're a voter, and your voice is important. That's coming up. We're going to have a new Congress uh, in January, the 118th Congress. So Congress passes laws, right? They passed the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It was first passed in the early 70s when we had Public Law 94-142. And educators on this call will have heard that in all of your beginning special education coursework. But once that law is passed, within the U.S. Department of Education, there's the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, which is called OSERS, because just like us every day in our classrooms and in special education, we have acronyms. So does the US Department of Education. And under within the Department of OSERS is OSEP, the Office of Special Education Programs. This is the office that writes the regulations of the law that Congress passes that we're implementing in our classrooms. That next step down is your State Department of Education. Your State Department then is writing regulations to meet any additional state law to implement special education programs. And then you and your school district have a local compliance plan. And your local compliance plan adheres to state regulations, which adheres to state law, which adheres to federal regulations, which adheres to federal law. So it's this, this long list of things we do in special education to comply with, with all of that. And it's important that you understand because it's important that you vote at the state level and that you vote at the national level for your U.S. congressmen, your U.S. senators, your U.S. House of Representatives, as well as those state elected offices. So just before we get into the real advocacy that we were doing in July in Washington, D.C., I just want to give you a little bit of an update about what's been happening lately. And the first thing I want to make you aware of is on May the 6th, uh, of this year, the U.S. Department of Education announced uh, their intent to strengthen and protect rights for students with disabilities by amending the regulations implementing Section 504. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, we write 504 plans in our schools for individuals with disabilities that require accommodations. Many times there's a big connection with special education and our special ed leaders are having to uh, implement that law as well as the IDEA. It's important that you know that these laws have not been, or these regulations have not been amended in 45 years. So the Office of Civil Rights, which is uh, the office that implements and regulates this law will be looking to redo those regulations. 
CASE has participated in a listening session by invitation with the Office of Civil Rights, and we're actually going to meet face-to-face -face in September in Washington, D.C. with one of the assistant secretaries of OCR to say, here are the changes we believe need to take place. Here are the things that, as educators, we are advocating for. So CASE is out there working for you. I just want to make you aware of how important that is to know what is happening uh, with Section 504. Then, then in July, July 19th this year, we received new guidance on discipline out of the Office of Special Education Programs. You need to stay real tuned to what's happening in case. We'll be talking about that on a webinar in September with Julie Weatherly, an attorney out of Alabama who does a lot of work with us. Uh, the Office of Special Education Programs is also developing some webinars and some guidance around the document that came out. And CASE will be a part of looking and reviewing that initial webinar before it gets released to the entire public and having an opportunity to give OSEP some feedback. Those things are important because CASE has become more and more visible. We want to carry your voice forward. We are being asked what needs to happen, what needs to change. Your involvement in this organization, working at your state level and providing us feedback through your state leaders, even directly to us in the case office is important because we want to carry your voice forward. The other thing that I would just tell you to kind of be on the lookout for is we're still recovering some from the pandemic. Some of our school districts um, have received some complaints and the Office of Civil Rights is going in to say, are you following these laws, the laws that have been passed? Uh, are you still providing those services? Did you provide the type of services that you should have been doing during the pandemic? You will see a lot, uh, it's coming out. I every Just about every webinar that I'm on uh, with someone out of the US Department of Education, they're talking about the Los Angeles uh, Unified School District, LA Unified School District. And that's one of the largest, I think it's the second largest school district in the nation. And they did uh, undergo some investigation about did they comply? Did they comply with the laws and the rules of IDEA throughout the pandemic? And they found that they had uh, some areas where they uh, weren't quite up to speed. So they have, as a result of this investigation, they're engaged in a settlement agreement. And uh, it's a lot of work for the Los Angeles uh, Unified School District. I tell you this story to say, it's important that you pay attention to the requirements of special education that we must follow as administrators and as teachers in our business. And when those things need to change and we need to be looking differently at how they should change, that's where your advocacy comes into play. So I'm gonna talk now a little bit more specifically about advocacy and what we do at that level. CASE has been advocating uh, through our Hill visits on Capitol Hill for 20 years. And about eight years ago, the Council for Exceptional Children, our parent organization said, we wanna partner with you. Now I tell the story, I know they wanted to partner with us because we were doing it right. We knew how to go in there. We knew how to uh, get the attention of our legislators. We were sharing our stories about what is happening in our local school districts. And they said, you guys are doing it right. We wanna partner with you. And we said, absolutely wanna partner with you because we that brings more teachers to the table. Our group has grown. We've had 300, up to 300 people gathering, going up on Capitol Hill, educating, and advocating for change and advocating for the things that we need in our local school districts. There is strategy around how you advocate. And that's why we come together to learn about, here's what we say, here's how we say it, here's how we get their attention when we go up on Capitol Hill. One of those things is to narrow our focus. So we narrow, narrow our focus and what we wanna talk about. And what you see on the screen right now are those three primary topics. We know that educator shortage is the issue right now uh, across the nation that is impacting, critically impacting our schools um, uh, in every state. The most recent information that I believe I read was 
48 states have reported a critical shortage of educators as we've started, as we begin to start this school year. Some haven't started yet, but many of our schools have started across the nation. Our second topic that we uh, addressed with our uh, congressman was the issue of mental health and the needs that we have in our school district that have grown. They've always been there. They've always been great. But now we're seeing a greater need as a result of what we have experienced through the pandemic, the impact that it's had on our families and our students, as well as our staffs. And the third issue, no secret to anyone, would be appropriations. We usually talk about this and use the word funding, but we have a law and funding is, uh, is, is they've told us up to 40%. We'll talk a little bit more about it. But what we advocate for is not like more funding. What we want to get to is the appropriations committees, because every year they're appropriating money for education and for special education. So we want to tell them exactly what we need from year to year in appropriations. So we'll talk a little bit more in depth about that. George, I know I'm kind of shifting gears and going in, but I'm wondering if there are any questions that maybe we would want to, I know we're going to do Q&A at the end, but anything that we would want to talk about or answer questions regarding the discipline or 504 or anything along those lines uh, before we move into our advocacy, uh, specific advocacy uh, information that we did in July on Capitol Hill. We haven't had anything specific come up as of yet. Um, I'm monitoring the chat as we speak, but uh, wouldn't use this as an invitation to everyone. As you have questions, please put them in the chat. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, I'll keep going. So educator shortage, you know that um, uh, some of the data that we gathered uh, to share with our congressmen on Capitol Hill, what we know as, we, as I just said, 48 states have reported staff shortage. Some of the data that we've looked at is high school students cite pay as the number one reason for disinterest in education. So we know that pay is an issue across the nation. The debt load is considerably higher given the starting salary of our teachers. So all of us have come out of college possibly with uh, with debt, with loans, we know that more and more across the nation, our students are coming out of college. However, given the starting salary of teachers versus the starting salary of some other professions, we're seeing that that debt load is heavier on our teachers. We've got to do something about that. Hey, Phyllis, we do have a, a comment. Um, it's not a question per se, but it's maybe something that you could speak to that's in line with this. Sandra Singleton says, I know that the shortage of SLPs is due in large part to the serious difficulties we have experienced while trying to successfully complete our daily work. The abuse of SLPs by some school districts makes me hesitant to return to schools. I think that's a recurring theme that we're seeing a lot of in addition to the pay issue and maybe that's something that you can elaborate on. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandra, thank you so much for that comment. Um, I think that that is an issue uh, as we continue to advocate, these are the kind of things that we want to hear. Because I think when you talk about um, uh, serious difficulties we've experienced while trying to successfully complete our daily work, um, I guess if I were to say, what would that serious difficulties be? Maybe uh, caseloads uh, uh, too high? Uh, using you to maybe cover classes uh, when teachers have been absent. I've heard some of those stories as well. Um, I also think about some of the behavioral issues that we're dealing with with students. I actually read an article uh, just not too long ago where a teacher uh, at I, actually, it was a paraprofessional, and it was work at McDonald's for the same pay that I'm a paraprofessional and not be hit and bitten by students. And, um, and, I, and I hear that loud and clear. So we continue to carry that voice forward, Sandra, of your comments to say, these are what our teachers are dealing with. 
And as administrators, we need to then look very closely at how we're using our staff, the resources we're providing our staff. Um, so I hear you loud and clear and, um, and would agree with you that those are issues in a number of our schools. Uh, again, here I've said it. Yeah, I, and I actually had it in my PowerPoint. 48 states uh, reported that was in the 2021 school year. Uh, I don't think maybe I have that exact number for the start of this school yet, as some schools haven't started. I will tell you, though, and I have linked in the PowerPoint, if, if George posts the PowerPoint on the website, um, that just this um, uh, week, actually two days ago, we had uh, an announcement out of the White House to address the issue of educator shortage, to strengthen the teaching profession, to help schools fill vacancies. And for the first time that I can remember in my history, at least to this level, to, to this depth, uh, the White House uh, is partnering with some private industry to really help um, I think re, uh, recruit teachers to the field uh, of, ed, of education. They have uh, joined in a partnership with ZipRecruiter, a partnership with Indeed to do some job fairs, and a partnership with Handshake. Uh, Handshake is online uh, where students in colleges and universities uh, are can be members, I think automatically at a number of those uh, institutions of higher education to really encourage them to go into the field of education. So this initiative is new. I would really encourage you to check that out and take a look and read um, what the Biden and Harris administration is offering up in the direction that they would like to go. They've also talked about the pay for teachers. Uh, that we need a more competitive wage. Uh, I haven't read the full report to see if there are additional initiatives for how they might assist local school districts in doing that. They do talk a lot about the ARP funds uh, and the ESSER funds that have come through and how school districts can use uh, some of that funding and then expanding high quality programs that prepare and support our teachers. So that would be uh, hopefully uh, putting more of those funds or some additional fundings into higher education. That's what we hope for. So I would tell you all about educator shortage. We do have initiatives coming out of the White House. What we know is the White House does not create laws. The White House does not appropriate funds. That happens in our House of Representatives and in the Senate. And so as we vote and our voices are heard, we must carry these issues forward to uh, those that we vote into office and tell them exactly what we need. If we see things coming out of the White House, we want to say, please do more for this initiative. Please do more. If there are bills that need to be um, passed or even created, you can have that conversation with your congressman. Um, and they come to your U.S. Uh, congressman, come to your home state. They have offices there uh, and you can visit with them when they're at, uh, at recess. They, they just should have been in your state the month of August because Congress had a huge recess. Everyone goes home and they meet with their constituents within their states. Let's go on to um, just another piece. Uh, and Sandra, this might fit in a little bit to, to what you were saying. The Council for Exceptional Children did a, um, uh, a study. They did a big survey on uh, the state of the profession. They had done this about 20, 25 years ago, and they felt it was important that they look at that again. And they did a new survey. And out of their survey, they found what teachers need to be successful. And here's where the teacher responses. We take this information, we share it so that people will know what teachers need, adequate resources to meet IEP requirements for my students. That's what teachers told us. Smaller class sizes and smaller caseloads. This is a big one, administrators who support the IEP process. So we're listening to our teachers. 
Um, we share this information when we do advocate on Capitol Hill to say, here's what our teachers are telling us. We need your help in making this happen. The fourth one, what teachers need most uh, in addition to those top three, knowledgeable paraeducators, a principal who is a strong instructional leader, professional development, reduced paperwork, access to related service providers, access to technology, and access to general ed curriculum. These were the things that teachers told us. This is the information that we take and advocate uh, to our congressmen on Capitol Hill. So we have direction, we have data, we have some research that says, here's what we need, here's why we need it. Next, I wanna to talk just a little bit about mental health. Approximately, as, we, well, as I said earlier, we know this has always been a need in our schools, but now we're seeing it more than ever as a result of what our country has just been through in the last two, two and a half years. But approximately 20% of children are experiencing significant mental, emotional, or behavioral symptoms that would qualify them for psychiatric diagnosis. Children most likely to access mental health services in an educational setting only are those receiving public insurance, living in low income neighborhoods from racial, ethnic and minoritized groups. But what we know is we need lots of people accessing those services, not just a select few. Nearly 70% of youth with mental health problems do not receive the treatment that they need. In a 2019 report from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, it indicates that 60% of the nearly 4 million 12 to 17 year olds who reported a major depressive episode in the past year did not receive any treatment whatsoever. We also know, um, I didn't include that data, I, I'm not sure I had the most recent, but we also know there's been an increased rate in suicide and suicide attempts. We see a lot of that information that comes from our school psych associations as they track that data and that, res that research. So we take this data, we go to Capitol Hill. You're gonna hear me say this time and time again. It's so important that we share the research, we share the data and we share our needs with our congressmen. The next, um, the, the third issue that we took was appropriations and funding. So here's what we know about special education. It's a federally mandated law. We must implement special education programs in our local public schools by law. Congress promised to fund this law when it was originally passed at 40%. 40% is what the federal government should be sharing with us to implement the laws that they passed. We do have a local responsibility and a state responsibility to educate students, all students, including students with disabilities. So 40% when Congress first passed the law thought that was a reasonable amount for the mandates that they were requiring. However, Special education programs across the nation in our local public schools are funded at approximately 13%. So where's the rest of the money coming from? Local and state contributions. We continue to advocate that Congress fund IDEA at the 40% that they promised. We did get close when we had the Americans, we call them the ARA funds, the Americans Recovery and Reinvestment Act under President Obama. There was a two year period where additional funds were released to special education. And the figure that we, uh, many of us had calculated across the nation, we received, we believe close to 40%. We calculated it at about 38%. So we enjoyed that money but for two years only, and then it wasn't there any longer. So we had to be very careful about how we spent that. This is why we continue to advocate for ongoing continuous funding. And we look at the House side, the uh, House Appropriations Committee and contacting those legislators, the Senate Appropriations Committee and saying, here's the money that we need. Here's what was promised. 
There is a bill in Congress uh, called the Full Funding Act right now. It has not been passed. We continue to advocate for additional co-signers to come on so that to come on to that bill uh, so that we can uh, get some additional funding for special education. I do want to tell you now how you can uh, get involved and you can uh, 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 get more information. So I talked about those three issues. There is some detailed information. I'm going to show you a screenshot of them here in just a minute. You can look on special education legislative summit.org. And our issue briefs are located there that will give you some detailed information. You can take those, you can email them to your congressman, you can mail them to your congressman, you can share that information with them. If you wanna write them a letter to advocate for uh, assistance in addressing the issue of educator shortage, the issue of mental health, or the issue of appropriations and additional funding uh, in special education. This is what our issue briefs look like. This is the one on educator shortage. It's two pages. We do it front and back and we hand that to our legislators when we go into their office on Capitol Hill. This will talk even more specifically about some of the, the data and the research, the research that has been done in a particular area of educator shortage. And then what we ask members of Congress to do, we ask them to invest $300 million in Part D, which is the personnel prep programs for special education. We ask them to invest, uh, and that should be $300 million into uh, the Center for Excellence program, and additional into teacher quality partnerships, a billion dollars there. The next is issue brief was mental health. Again, we talk about some of the fast facts and what we're dealing with as far as uh, behavioral and mental health issues in our schools. And we then said, here's what we want members of Congress to do. We want them to support the, uh, the bills that include additional funding to help us meet the needs of students, uh, as well as any legislation that would provide more services to our schools and mental health. This is the issue brief on appropriations, and we get right down to business with the IDEA Part B and saying, here's the amount of money we need to bring us up to level funding at 40%. Part C are the early uh, childhood programs, uh, birth to age three. Part B are the three and four-year-old programs and our K-12 programs. Then Part D, again, is the personnel prep. And then we have some additional appropriations levels with school-based mental health professionals, the Center for Special Education Research, because we need our data. Our data says, here's where we are, here's what we need, here's where we need to be, help us get there. And then the gifted and talented um, uh, programs that we usually ask for additional funding in that area as well. So the issue briefs, again, you can find at the special education legislative summit.org. There is also a brief that just over, does, does a brief overview of what the IDEA, uh, IDEA is and some facts about that. As we go into offices, uh, whether that be at the state level or the federal level, many times our representatives or senators may not know the specifics around this particular federal law that you are required in your local school district to pass. This is a, a quick, fast fact sheet that you can pull down off the website, specialeducationlegislativesummit.org. You can copy all of these. You can have this information. You could even share this information if you're a teacher or support staff with your principal. Uh, if they're not aware of all the requirements of special education. So some great resources for, for you to engage with. Now, here's how you can take action today. You could go to the CASE Legislative Action Center on our website at casecec.org. You can right now text CASE ACTS to this number, and it will have you sign up for our uh, action center to address 
these three issues. Tell Congress to fund special education programs, address educator shortages, and tell Congress to support funding for mental health services in our schools. So if you, in fact, text CASE ACTS to 50457, you can sign up. You do have to put your name and your address in there. And then your U.S. congressmen, senators, and House of Representatives will pop up and you can send to them a letter that's already populated. You can change that letter and add a personal note to it and it will go push a button and that letter will be sent advocating, telling them that you uh, need their support in these areas. One of the things that you need to know is they pay attention. They count how many of my constituents, how many of my voters want me to fund special education programs. When they see that number go up, that helps them determine how they will vote on any bills. That will determine how they vote on the full funding act, the bill that is in Congress right now. I think that takes us down to some Q&A, Jeremy. That concludes my presentation. I hope I've covered uh, as much as I possibly could in that time period. You know, we spent a full day in Washington, D.C. Um, advocating and learning and educating ourselves on these issues in order to be prepared to meet uh, with the staff. Uh, and many of us got to meet with our congressmen face to face. But if not, we met with some of the brighter people about education, which was their education staff people. Um, but uh, I have I'll to stop say there. This, it was such a great experience this year because for the previous two years, we weren't able to go physically to the Hill. And I've been going for a number of years and it has been such an incredibly eye-opening opportunity to sit down with staffers, talk about education policy and see how many issues are on their list beyond just what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think that to your point, when the numbers tick up, when we're expressing our interest and we're talking them about these issues, it helps bring it to top of mind. It helps remind them how important and how impactful it really is. So thank you for sharing. And I hope everyone here takes the action that you've called us to. I know I have. I've gone to the Action Center. I've reached out to my, my representatives. And uh, as a matter of fact, as a result of all these different steps, I'm going to be meeting with um, Congressman Owens here in the next few weeks to just awesome. talk about awesome. what matters to, to me, what we're seeing, what he's seeing. Mm -hmm. And I think the most, important, the, the most important thing that you're doing, Jeremy, that we have really encouraged uh, so many people to do is to develop that relationship with uh, your member of Congress, with your senator, to say, um, not just one time, you, go, you don't just go up to the office one time in July and you say, here's what we need. What they need to do is hear from you regularly. It is making that contact consistently and building a relationship. What do we know about people who, uh, we know about our kids. How do they learn best? When they have a relationship. How do our congressmen learn best? When they have a relationship with us mm -hmm. and we can continue to feed them information and we build that trust, right? We build mm -hmm. the trust to say, um, here's what we need. Here's what I do. I know you, you know me, and uh, I'm being honest with you. I need this in my schools. Mm -hmm. You need to vote for this. And uh, that's how we, that's how we impact change. I've seen it firsthand. Mm -hmm. We've talked about some incredible things. How do we address educator shortages? How do we make sure that mental health services are, are funded and programmed into schools? We've talked about appropriations. We have some questions that I'd like to pose and then uh, lead into a conversation here, Phyllis, with you. I want to give another plug to those of you listening. If you have a question as we discuss these topics, please throw them in the chat. Really, truly, honestly, this is part of how the conversation happens and you can influence the conversation with your questions. The first one I wanna pose is from Justin and he asks, 
Can you speak to how the dyslexia advocacy movement is changing policies and instructional practices in special education? I think I just whistled out of my mouth there for a second. That's all right. But I got special it. education, what related changes might be on the horizon? Mm -hmm. Well, what we know, um, that's a great question, Justin. What we know is there is a huge movement um, and the, that movement is coming. Um, I apologize if you hear the sirens. Evidently, there is a fire near my office. Uh -oh. uh, Hopefully it's uh, not you. Well, I hope it's going on past. Okay. Uh, there we go. <laughs> All right. So, um, but, but what we know is there is an organization called Decoding Dyslexia. And they have established, um, I want to say chapters, or they have organized in almost every state. And they are advocating very heavily for screening and evaluation of students to see if they are dyslexic or qualify for special education through dyslexia. What we know is there's a lot of misunderstanding about dyslexia across the nation. We look at federal law and under federal law, under the eligibility that we talk about learning disabilities, it does state dyslexia. Although the misunderstanding with educators is, well, we don't do dyslexia. Um, that's, we do learning disabilities. Well, Dyslexia is a form of a learning disability, and we have to do more education around that. So what has happened in some states is they have been very successful in partnering proactively, strategically, and positively with decoding dyslexia to work together on a good law, because what's happening in most states is they're developing state law around dyslexia. And in some states, it has um, been a very collaborative effort. In other states, it has been more adversarial. So uh, it, it's, it's kind of all over the board right now, but we are seeing that impact. We're seeing some significant changes taking place in state law uh, around dyslexia. I hope I answered that question. I think you did. Justin, if you have a follow-up, put it in the chat and we'd love to keep talking about it. This actually, um, I want to go back to the 504 discussion that you brought up early in your presentation. And early in May, we heard for the first time that, that our country is revisiting the 504 regulations. And I'd like to have a deeper conversation about that and maybe see what you're seeing, share what I'm seeing. How do you think that though, how do you think those regulations will be revised? Does it include things like depression, anxiety, or anything else? Do you have any oh. insights that you can share with us? Mm -hmm. Well, it currently currently can include those uh, those areas. And, and we should be, as educators, looking at our students eligible under 504 because of um, something that is impacting a major life function. And many times we know that depression and anxiety can, and students could be eligible for that now. What we think, um, what we know some people are advocating for under changes for 504 are more regulatory requirements. We have a concern that if we have more and more regulatory requirements and more and more paperwork under 504, that uh, we will drive more and more teachers out of the field of education. I Not agree because we know education. 504 doesn't have specific appropriations. Exactly, and no funding, no, no funding. funding. And so if we, you know, we think, okay, for me, it's, it's very important to know what is changing about 504. And I sure hope that yeah. as we have these conversations and those who are involved are ensuring that appropriations or funding is part of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Because we definitely don't want to just ask more from our educators, but not fund or appropriate for it. Right. I think I cut you off. Please continue your no, we, thought. 
Our, our biggest concern is, and, and you didn't cut me off. No, though you you made a an extraordinarily valid point uh, that when we meet in September with the Office of Civil Rights, we will reiterate, and that is the the lack of funding that accompanies this federal law, uh, this federal mandate uh, that school districts must uh, implement. But we have a concern uh, based on what we're hearing and, and how things sometimes roll out from the US Department of Education, that they wanna make this a mini IDEA. Okay. And so much of the guidance that we get right now says, well, if you do evaluation procedures like you do under IDEA, then you'll be fine. Uh, if you do a, a service plan or you develop an IEP under 504, well, you'll be fine. Well that's not required in order for us to implement this law because it is a law that is, uh, it's a non-discrimination law. So it's about providing accommodations, not necessarily direct services, though you could provide direct services under that law. Some people think you don't have to, or you, do, or you can't, but you can. So what we need around 504 is more specific clarification not regulatory requirements. And that's what we're advocating for at this point. I really love that, Phyllis. I agree. And and if there's if there's more that we can do to provide that clarification around what it is and what it means. Because I get the question of, well, does 504 cover accommodations in, in depression or anxiety? And I think you cleared that up very nicely today. Um, yeah. This this also begs a question around um, mental health services or school-based mental health services and how those would be funded. We've seen a lot of, of a really um, great movement in this area. There's funding that we can access through grant programs, ESSER, ARP, even the most recent Safer Communities Act of 2022 earmarks a billion dollars in the coming years. And even still, there's a pending cliff that I think causes hesitancy on, on many school districts' decision-making process or even on our side and, and a long-term funding source that we can build programming around that gives more specific guidance to expectations. And I've heard some talk about, well, is that going to come through an IDEA-like authorization, or is that coming through 504? And the honest truth is, we don't know right now. But what I am very encouraged by is that folks at NASP are at the table having conversations around that. Folks from ASCA are having conversations around that. I know that CASE is at the table having conversations around how do we ensure long-term funding for mental health services? And I'm curious if you have any commentary around that. I do. I do, as a matter of fact. Um, well, we'd I, love to hear it. I, I know. I think that, um, you know, a, a couple, two major points. What we know is that educators are in our classrooms to teach. And to teach, uh, we kind of think about academics uh, and, and we kind of go that direction. That's what we're trained to do, right? To, to teach subject areas. But we also have to be aware of what the social and emotional needs are of all of our students. But we also need partners to address those specific needs. I'm not a trained counselor. It would be, uh, it, it would be in really poor form for me to try and assist someone who might be dealing with depression or anxiety. I, I don't have training in that. And I could do more harm than good. I could give them my best mama talk, you mm -hmm. know, but that probably is not going to help the situation in the long run. Mm -hmm. So I think there are, there are some really strong models across the nation of partnerships with schools and behavioral health care facilities. Um, there is a really, there's a great model, and I do have to brag a little bit here in my hometown of Springfield, Missouri, uh, with an organization called Burl Behavioral Healthcare. And they are a certified community behavioral health care center, which means their funding is a little bit different because of federal legislation that was passed. They have increased in over the last two years 
that this particular behavioral health care facility has hired over 500 new staff members to work in schools. Mm -hmm. And the schools have opened their doors. That's another thing schools have to do. They have to welcome in their partners to come and work with students. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think I know firsthand as a special educator and a special ed educator who worked with students with behavioral needs is until we get behavior under control, kids' brains are not in a uh, in a state to where they can learn academics. And we do have to tend to that first and foremost in our situation. So as you can see, I have a lot to say on that topic and I could probably keep I love going. The passion. Uh, I love the I, passion. Yeah, and it, I think it, that, we have to find the experts to come and partner with us. Yes, yes. And, and I, Justin has a very related question. Has the Biden-Harris FY22 investment in school psychologists, counselors, nurses and social workers led personnel, uh, or sorry, led to increased support personnel being hired nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have specific data on that, Justin. I think that part of it is we are still in the process of implementing some of those new funding opportunities. Um, I, I think it's also noteworthy that recently California announced a plan um, investing 4.7 billion into their infrastructure. And you can go read that if you Google Governor Newsom's mental health plan and you can find more details. But Phyllis, what, what experience or comment do you have on the, the outcomes since some of these investments are being made? Mm -hmm. I, I think you're right in that we don't have that data. Uh, what I, what I can tell you that I hear from our administrators across the nation in some pockets there there is there is change occurring some of that uh, a result of some of the ESSER funding that came through during the pandemic we know a lot of that was put into um, some infrastructure and changes which we know a number of our public schools across the nation needed I know that there are in some pockets where partnerships have been made with institutions of higher education to do alternative um, road to certification or fast track to certification. We have grow your own programs um, that are happening in education. I would hope that those are happening with school psychs and counselors and nurses and social workers as well. Um, but I don't think we have the data to see yet exact research, exact numbers of how that's been impacted. It is good that the White House brought private partners into the mm -hmm. Oval Office and had those conversations. I know you and many other colleagues were on a call with the White House recently. And um, George, why don't we share that press release from the White House as a resource for this group? Because it is hot off the press. It just came out within the past two days. And it talks about private partner strategies. It talks about building the pipeline, investing in, in competitive living wages for teachers and specialized instruction, uh, instructional providers. And so my only other comment on this would be that we study this a lot at Iluma and where the gaps are. There is a very large gap with speech and language pathologists and occupational therapists. Unfortunately, the shortages in those specialized fields pale in comparison to those in the mental health side of the house to the tune of three times larger than where we see in the SLP and OT shortage gaps. Um, Lori Vanderplug, the former director of OSEP, and I know one of Phyllis's good friends as well, recently came and did a presentation and we have over 40,000, this is per report that she referenced, over 40,000 openings in our schools today and nearly 160,000 underqualified professionals in our schools today. So I know that that's just accentuating the gap and the problem that we're trying to address. And what I'm trying to communicate is that it is positive that we see the investments being made, that conversations are, are had at the highest levels of our governmental leadership. And I believe that people are taking this very seriously from pipeline to classroom to retention. 
and uh, it's going to take private, public, and a whole community partnership to address this. And I know we're at time, um, and maybe we'll close with a closing statement here. We didn't get to elevating the profession, but I just wanna say that all of us in this room today and who are listening to this presentation and, and webinar have an opportunity to influence the dialogue around the aspirations to be an educator, a therapist, or an administrator. Unfortunately, there's a negative rhetoric in many of the articles that we read and many of the reports that we hear. And uh, I think it's time that we lead from the front, that we change the rhetoric in our local communities, in our homes, and in ourselves, because we need teacher professions and administrator professions to be something that young people and old people aspire to. And I think from an advocacy perspective, Jeremy, you uh, you hit the nail on the head. We definitely need to elevate the profession by telling the good stories that are happening in our schools today. And if you're on this call and you're working with, um, with students, you're working with teachers, send a great story today to one of your, or to all of your um, congressional offices and tell them the good things that are happening in public education today. They need to hear the good things that you're doing. Uh, too many times they only hear the bad. And that's part of the story that everyone needs to hear. And invite them to come to your classroom. Invite them, invite them every month to come to your classroom or to come to your school if you're an administrator, if you haven't. And, 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 and if you keep doing it and they keep hearing from you, they've got to come and see the good things you, you're doing and not only the good things you're doing, but the things you need to keep doing all those good things. I love it. Phyllis, mm -hmm. thank you so much. I want to, I know we're just a couple minutes over time, but I want to wrap up by letting you know, we have two webinar series, two paths, one for MTSS and mental health, one for special education. Today, you're participating in one of our, well, in our first webinar uh, of the special education series. On September 14th, we are very excited to have Dr. Kelly Valencourt Strobach to come and join us in the second webinar of the MTSS and mental health series. Go to eluma.com slash webinars to find more details and register. Then the following week, we will have the second webinar of this special education series. And we're very excited to have Mitchell Samet join us. That is on September 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, same place. Go to Iluma slash webinars to find out more. And for those of you who want to learn more, come join the conversation. Please consult with us. You will get a $100 Amazon gift card for scheduling a consultation and using the Iluma webinars promotional code. Take action today in, in several different ways. Schedule a consultation. Go and make sure that you sign up with uh, the Case Action Center. Contact your local reps and your national reps. We want to thank you for being here, and we're excited to continue engaging with you as we move forward. Have a great weekend, everyone.